Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in. I hope everybody's having an unbelievable day. Uh, look, I'm not going to take too much time. Uh, just got back in town from spending time with baby girl. makes my day, uh, my week, uh, but anyway, look, not going to take much time, you know the routine, if you believe in what we're doing, show some love, show some support, what we do is it something that is free, we offer our services free, but it definitely costs, uh, on that note, I'm going to move right into what I'm talking about, it seems that a lot of people are big mad because Deion Sanders took a head coaching job at the University of Colorado. Let me properly frame this so that we can kill some of the labels that'll be thrown at me because I'm probably going to piss a lot of people off. So we can kill some of the labels that's going to be thrown at me. Me personally, I would have liked to see him stay and finish what he started in doing. Uh, but in truth, he did a lot. I'm not going to go into all the things he did, uh, but he increased uh, revenue uh, from um, uh, endowment revenue. He uh, got new facilities. He increased the awareness of the program, not just the program, the entire conference. Uh, he donated half his salary because of shortcomings in funding and revenue. Uh, he did a lot in a very short period of time. Now, with that being said, I would have loved to see him continue what he was doing. I don't know what his plan is. I don't know what was behind the decision because the last I heard, he had said he was staying put. Uh, so I don't know what came, what went on. Uh, and we may never know or we may not find out until later. Um, here's my thing. Again, I personally would like him to stay out, you know, but at the same time, here's the thing. I've been around the black community and working in the black community and doing things for the black community and studying under and studying unbelievable leaders that gave so much of their lives and here's what I can tell you our people don't support you our people don't get behind you enough to turn down five million dollars and I'm not saying that Dion needs it uh in essence but he has kids uh, I think at least six if I'm not mistaken um and he's doing what he's doing and so first thing that I have a problem with with the people who are mad at Dion a bunch of people you got to remember I collect data so when you're posting and making comments on my page, I download that every four months. Everything on my Facebook page, I download. So if you come in on Facebook and then I, chron I catalog what I get, because I get emails from every comment on YouTube. So I, I save them. And so I look at the people who say what, so I can understand where they're coming from. It's understanding my people. It's not to go back and shoot nobody down when they say something. It's to sit up and say, okay, this is what my people are thinking. This is where 60% of my people are right now. This is where 10% of my people are. It's to get an understanding. It's a part of how I do research. It's an um, Social media is an unbelievable tool, and whether you realize it or not, everybody's studying you. This is how companies know how to do what with their marketing how to do what with their designs, with their program development, with everything. It's because they're on social media studying your engagement and directly engaging you. And you are com uh, communicating back. No, I don't like this. I hate this. Or I love it when this. They're paying attention to all of that. So I try to use it for the sake of helping us and strengthening us and uh, advancing us. But here's my problem. My first problem. My first problem is that a bunch of people that said he was going to fail are the ones mad at him now because he succeeded and he succeeded at a level that he has an opportunity to leave and go do something else. Uh, I don't think the people who were down in him in the beginning have a right to determine what happens when he succeeds uh, when they said he was going to fail. 
Now, for the people who are Dion fans that were hoping, that was hoping he succeeded, and he succeeded, and now that are extremely disappointed, I get it. I did not attend uh, an H HCB, uh, a HBCU. Uh, I went to a Division One school, uh, and you know that, that's what that that's that set the path of my life. So I'm not apologizing for it, but. For those of you, just, I get it. You know, I know there's a lot of pride that goes in there. There's a lot of desires to see some things happen. Uh, here's here's here, here, here's my thing with that. Dion is not HBCU in the sense of having ever attended. He attended, a, again, a Division One school in Florida State at the time when the program was at its height. Um, and so he came into a situation and he gave it himself. He gave all of himself to it, and he did a lot. He made sacrifices. He went hard to paint, all while fighting for his life. Most people don't even realize that how serious that leg surgery and leg injury became. He almost died, and so he gave a lot of himself. So my thing is look at what you get. No other coach in college football is being asked to sacrifice their future for anything and we're putting that on Dion's back you know Dion isn't our messiah we got to stop looking for the next messiah that was never a black messiah it wasn't Marcus Garvey it wasn't Malcolm X it wasn't Martin Luther King it wasn't uh Mega Everest it wasn't anyone out of the Black Panther Party it, it, it's, it's not, it has, it wasn't Yosef Ben Yakin, and it wasn't Naeem Akbar, it wasn't Amos Wilson, it wasn't Khaled Muhammad, all of them unbelievable beasts in their, in their own right. I mean, straight up exactly what we needed at the time, but they weren't messiahs. There is no messiah. We are our saviors as a collective. Stop looking for one person to fix what we're all supposed to be working on. That's the thing I'm looking at. We're frustrated because we feel helpless. Like Dion should have did. Dion has a platform. Dion has exposure. Dion has some things he can do. He did that. There's enough of us. There are 47, 48 million of us in this country. There's enough of us to come together and unify. And I've been talking about unification for God knows how long. And that's our weakness. We are wanting someone to do something nobody else has been able to do. None of those people I mentioned in the past could hold us together long enough for us to get to where we wanted to go. But here, here, here's the second half of that thing. Again, as I was stating in the beginning, I've been around my people long enough and I've watched some heavy hitters, many of the ones I've just named, give everything they had and die broke because our people don't get behind you. I've funded my program, 99% of my program is funded by me, 20 years plus. Our people don't get behind us. So to sit up and get upset because he takes a job where he's making 300,000 a year, half of which he's donating back to the university. So uh, he, he go he leaves that and uh, takes a $5 million gig and you don't know what else his strategy is. I'm not caping for him. I'm not championing anything, but I think that he gave enough of himself to solidify who he was. He came in, he showed what he was capable of doing. He left the program in a better place than when he found it. That's what you ask of anybody that walks into any situation. When I look at the things that I've been through and I'm, I'm, I'm no longer in those things, I say, is the situation better than when I found it? You know, do I want to stay longer? Maybe, maybe not. But am I leaving it in a better situation than when I found it? If I can say I'm leaving it in a better situation than I found it, then I've got to be good and I've got to be prepared to take the next steps. Uh, not everything is for always. And I think he set the foundation. I, get, I think he showed him how to do it. I don't know what the remainder of I don't know what the transition plan is. I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm not saying it's the right choice, but what I'm saying is we got to be real careful what we ask people to do. And finally, very few, if very few, I'm not going to say if any, because there are some real hardcore people that go hard in the paint for blackness. Uh, but very few people that are asking him to turn down that kind of money to keep that money would actually do it.
So we have a bad habit of asking people in the black community to do things for the sake of blackness that we ourselves won't do. That has to stop. Never ask anybody to do something you're not willing to do, never. So if you're not willing to do it, don't ask anybody else to do it. If somebody is gonna come along right now, no matter how pro-black you are, offer you something that's gonna be in a situation where it moves you out of the scope of directly impacting a lot of black people, to primarily focus on what is viewed as a white system, what it's going to probably still have predominantly black athletes. We dominate the sport. So you're still talking about 70% of the, the athletes on the team are going to be black. And we'll have a better opportunity, at least right now, to further their uh, careers in the sport, whether it's actually as an athlete, in coaching, uh, in some other sport, just based on the size of the university and the reach of the university and so much more. I don't know what his plan is. I'm not going to pretend I know. I'm not going to try to make up some makeshift reason, but I'm saying there are ways of looking at this outside the fact that I'm leaving a black place to go to what is considered a white place, and I'm going to get paid a lot of money to do it. And now don't get me wrong, that's happened before. We've had people bought out of positions of influence. And I hope that's not what's happening. I hope that this isn't about buying out uh, someone who's having a positive impact in the black community uh, and buying them out of that position uh, for the sake of hurting that community they're helping. Uh, I hope that's not the case. I'm not going to speak on whether it is or isn't because I don't have enough information to do that. I'm just saying there are certain things I'm seeing my people do that we're not in a position to. We're not in a position to ask somebody to do something we don't ourselves want to do or will not do under any stretch of the imagination. And we are not in a position to demand somebody to do something when they've already done more for the program than has ever been done before. You know, we, we, we can't ask people to sacrifice their lives at a level that they only that everybody's benefiting off of them. But them. But see, that's the kind of thing we have. We, we'll ask people to do that. We want you to make sure everybody else is good. Fuck you. We've got to be real careful because that's in our families. <clears throat> it's in our relationships. It's how we do business. We need to learn how to make sure everybody's okay. That we don't put too much on everybody's shoulder. How about we all get together and sit up and say, we're gonna start funding programs. We're gonna start looking at bringing more qualified coaches, coaches in who want to be a part of that program. And maybe they don't stay long. <laughs> but maybe we get enough, enough of them in the next level to make a difference for our boys who play at Division I schools. But what we can't do is try to bully somebody into doing something more than they've already done, which is more than anybody's ever done for that school. Or you got to go back to Eddie Robinson. You got to go back that long to talk about anybody that's come close to having that kind of influence. And he did it in a couple of years you know, a few years. That's the power of what he's done. And I don't want, like I said, to be somebody that's caping for somebody that I don't know what they're doing, but I don't want to be the person that sits around and lets everybody just take, take free shots without understanding what's being done. <clears throat> I think we've got to uh, look at the body of work that he's done and say, hey, this dude left the program way better than it was. He left the conference far better than it was. And with that being said, he deserves a right to do what he feels is best for him and his family. And then we need to look at it at, you know, as it unfolds and see what's going on and make a final decision of how we feel about it. Because we have a right to feel how we feel. But I think that a bunch of us are jun uh, uh, jumping to judgment without any information outside he took the job you know you can't hold him hostage nobody else in coaching is being held hostage when there's another opportunity that's that's a better opportunity but we want our people to do it 
well, what, well, how about we get together and create a better system, create uh, better media uh, platforms, create better revenue flows and streams so we can offer our coaches million dollar salaries. And then we can say, okay, if you're leaving, it ain't for the money because we can pay you. If we're not doing that, what are we, what are we talking about? You know, that, that's my question. What are we really talking about? But on that note, look, I'm going to get off of here. Um, try to finish my... Got here. Like I said, I just got back in town. So I'm going to go sit down and relax for a minute. Uh, you guys have an unbelievable day. I'm out.